Welcome back to the Business Leaders of America podcast, where business leaders come to share their advice and journeys to success with existing and emerging leaders of America. Join us as we delve into the minds of these accomplished individuals, uncovering the strategies and insights that have propelled them to the top. Whether you're an established leader or an emerging force in the business world, this podcast is your go-to source for the knowledge and inspiration needed to navigate the dynamic landscape of American business. Now, here's your host, Dylan Bloyd. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Business Leaders of America podcast. Today, we're thrilled to welcome Marty Strong, CEO of Legacy Care, a leading healthcare company based in Virginia. Marty's distinguished career as a retired SEAL officer, motivational speaker, and best-selling author brings a unique blend of leadership expertise to the table. With a focus on delivering exceptional post-acute care and driving innovation in healthcare, Marty's vision for legacy care is both inspiring and impactful. Join us as we explore Marty's journey from the SEAL teams to the boardroom, uncovering insights into his leadership style, strategic vision, and commitment to empowering future leaders through mentorship and education. Welcome to the show, Marty. Thanks for having me, Dylan. Yeah, of course. All right, sir, if you could please give us a brief background on yourself and how you got to where you are today. That's the hardest question you're going to ask, I hope. Um, (laughs) Yeah, so I I originally... uh, Started out in Nebraska, middle of the country, joined the Navy when I was 17, and ended up volunteering for the SEAL teams, went through the, the selection course, uh, referred to as BUDS, or it's basic underwater demolition SEAL training. Hmm. Graduated from that course and then went into the SEAL team. So I was in the SEAL team for 20 years. I did half of that 20 years as an enlisted SEAL. Mm-hmm. And got to a senior rank in that and then went to officer's candidate school after I got a degree in business and became an officer. So I finished my career with 10 years as an officer and I got an MBA somewhere in there too. So that, that was my, uh, kind of my military period. And then I went to work for a finance services firm. And within a couple of months, excuse me, a couple of years, I went to, uh, I was picked up by United Bank of Switzerland. And I was a portfolio manager with them. So all in eight years managing money in the finance industry. Mm. And then I did a little bit of consulting uh, after 9-11 related to um, terrorism, counterterrorism, threat analysis, that kind of stuff. Mostly for our government. I was one of the key threat advisors for the Athens Olympics in 2004. Wow. And um, and that kind of pushed pushed me into government, government contracting and then one thing led to another, and I started moving up the ranks in the organizations and companies I was I was in, until I finally ended up being a uh, an equity owner in a really small company that the founder and I grew until we sold it hmm. to the employees, and that's kind of what I'm involved in now. It's the same entity. We sold it in 2015 to the employees, but I was asked by the private equity guys to stay on as the CEO. And I've been the CEO of that and other companies we've added over time. And that's kind of what I still do today. Wow. Your background as a U.S. Navy SEAL is admirable. And I first want to thank you for your service. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Can you share some experiences as a SEAL and how that shaped your leadership style and approach in your subsequent roles as a business leader and CEO? Sure. And, you know, it's funny, I... uh, I never thought of it that way. I never had anybody really put that question to me until I posed the question to myself in 2019 when I decided to write a book. Mm-hmm. And I was advising lots of people and I was obviously running companies and before that running divisions. And I was applying my leadership style, my philosophy. And I never really thought of it as a philosophy. I never thought of, I never codified it. I never wrote it down. And, you know, I just did what I did and I acted the way I did and I made decisions the way I did. And I mentored and tutored other leaders the way I did. And I think when I actually had to sit down and, and put, you know, metaphorically pen to paper to start writing Be Nimble, that was the first time I really started thinking, okay, do I really have an answer for every category that I should cover here? And and if I do, what is that answer? And at that point I'd been I'd been uh in commercial business for at least a decade. Okay. So I had a good mix of attributes and contributions to my leadership style. From the seal from the seal period but also from the post seal period and commercial period the things that that conveyed from the seal period was the thesis of being a seal is to never quit mm-hmm. 
you know, that when you quit, then trying to solve the problem ends because you've quit. So you can always try to work the problem, solve the problem, figure it out one way or the other until your last gasping breath, but you don't have to quit. So that that's one thing. And that, what it means really is psychological resilience is what they screen for for SEALs. That's what they train you to, to, to continue to build on so that you're used to things going wrong. Mm. You're trained that things are going to go wrong. It's in the basic course. They make everything wrong. They change the schedule. They do whatever they do. You never know what the hell is going to hit you. And they, they watch it. A lot of guys quit because they can't handle the constant unknown. They're mm-hmm. tired. They're fatigued. They eventually get cold. So that some of their, some of their, the way their brain functions is kind of broken down and they get to kind of the raw personality and whether they want to stay and put another foot in front of the other, or they've had enough. And what you're really trying to do is you're trying to weed out the people that are going to psychologically quit. Mm-hmm. And, and they do it to themselves. You know, you don't have to say anything to them. You don't have to yell. It's not like the Marine Corps, you know, like screaming at them in boot camp or something. You're just setting up these little evolutions, these little experiences, and you're, and you're watching them kind of decline in physical strength and stamina. And then that starts to affect the way their brain works. Well, so the people that get through that process are a breed of people that have psychological resiliency, not because the SEALs gave that to them, but because somewhere in their past, they had to create that. They had to be strong they had to have, they have scar tissue against you know fa- failure isn't the end of everything okay. and and that's the kind of person you want to start with right failure is just something you kind of step around and try to figure out what's the next way to solve the problem and then they they expand on that and then the rest of your time in the seal teams are adding more and more of these different scenarios and exercises and things to try to get you to you know you learn how to plan it the right way but you also learn how to think and make judgments you know, apply courage and, and intellect and, and uh, creativity when everything falls apart and all your assumptions just disappear. Mm-hmm. So those kinds of things are very much things you can apply in business leadership. Right. But to do it, you know, if you think about it, if I if it took three or four years to get me to where I could do that as a functional part of my personality, you'd have to have some kind of training in place in the commercial sector, mm-hmm. which is difficult to do in companies. It's You can do it with exercises. But very few companies ever give that kind of commitment to first their leaders, because you want the leaders to be resilient psychologically. You don't want them panicking every time there's an internal or an external you know, crisis. You want them to roll their sleeves up, get in a room, you know, mm-hmm. with a fresh cup of coffee and go up to the whiteboard and go, okay, how are we going to figure this thing out? Right. You know, that's what that's leadership. That's what you want, you know. So I found right off the bat that that's not what I was experiencing in the commercial world. And most of my my brethren in the SEAL teams or anybody that was in a special unit in the military that's used to kind of going psychologically the opposite way than most people. When the crap's hitting the fan, we tend to calm down and get really poised and start clearing our mind and start looking at the reality and let the information of that reality start coming into our head and not trying to second guess that reality. Mm -hmm. And most people do the opposite. They they panic, they shut down, they get tunnel vision, and they try to rely on what they know and trust from the past. Right. And it might work, but if whatever's confronting you is something new or a combination of things that that is a new combination, you're going to fail. So anyway, that that's that's kind of the mechanical value of military leadership, especially special operations leadership that you they're taught specifically to be able to do. And in business, if you could do the same thing, it could be a pandemic, which is a big, a larger scale thing. But at some point in the beginning of the pandemic, if you were a company that had immediate supply chain problem, you should have been in that room with a fresh cup of coffee with the leaders and a whiteboard saying, okay, how are we going to reinvent ourselves? Mm-hmm. How are we going to do this? You shouldn't have been sitting there in your rooms, in your house, and staring at the TV, looking at the numbers of COVID. <laughs> people yeah, going, right. Ah, you know. <laughs> but that's what people do. That's what people do in those, those kinds of circumstances. They it doesn't have to be a pandemic. It just be that there's a problem with their business or their industry or their market. And they tend to curl up in a little ball psychologically in the fetal position and wait for it to all go away. And it doesn't. Mm-hmm. You're absolutely right. I think that it's the fact that you can implement that into a business. I'm sure it's difficult because that took a lot of training and things like that. But as far as implementing small characteristics into your team, I mean, that it probably pays dividends for you. Right. Pick an industry and then say, okay, the ER of a hospital. Mm-hmm. Okay, get everybody in a room and say, let's come up with the worst case scenarios until you run out of imagination. Right. And let's walk through and storyboard how we would fix that. And you start learning what you didn't contemplate before. You might even put some new procedures in place that'll help stave off 
those things from happening. Mm-hmm. You can do it. it. It's not, you don't need a seal or a special trainer. It's right. just go in a room and start thinking up all the, all the scenarios that could come down and start working those scenarios as practice. That's mm-hmm. all. Yeah. I mean, of course, every situation is different, you know, but role playing like that gives you that opportunity to when something does arise that hasn't occurred before, you know how to how to handle it. Right. Compared to like you yeah. said, it's things slow down. But if you revert back to everything that you've done in the past and try and solve it the same way, probably not going to be always a, a positive result. Right. And you stop searching for the plan and you start behaving like it's time to create the plan. Right. Yeah. Which are two different two different ways to deal with the problem. Mm hmm. No, well, thank you for that. That is great. So I wanted to touch a little bit on legacy care. So what does a typical day in your role look like at legacy care? And what are the key priorities you focus on to drive the the company's success? So anybody in healthcare has been confronted with, obviously, I just mentioned the pandemic. So COVID had a big impact on the industry. Mm -hmm. There's other aspects like the uh, Affordable Care Act that has a programmed ratcheting down on how much uh, medical professionals are paid. And most, most Americans aren't even aware of that, but every year the government says, okay, now you can only get a, you know, getting a percent or 2%. And this year it was 3% less than you got last year. So that's always a challenge because what happens, uh, you know, doctors are scarce. Great doctors are even more scarce. And the same thing holds with nurse practitioners or physician's assistants or, or RNs. And, that has been flushing the high end of the of the labor market, the high end of the talent in healthcare, either to other industries, into early retirement, or into a cash based form of healthcare, like mm-hmm. cosmetic surgery or wellness and and holistic medicine. I ran into a doctor. I was going to look at being fitted for um, for hearing aids because most of my right ear from all the shooting and everything. Right and and he was a doctor and he left being a doctor after 14 years and became a distributor for a hearing aid company. And he was, had a little office and he was, he was making like 80% on every set of hearing aids he sold. And the hearing aids were like, you know, $8,000 that he was selling. I didn't buy them. Right. Um, so he's getting 80% of $8,000 and completely not doing medicine. And he was making hand, money, making money hands over fist compared to when he was doing all the paperwork and all that. And it's a reality. Dentists yeah. are doing it. They're going to dental surgery. So there's there's unintended consequences of governmental actions. There's unintended events like, you know, the pandemic. And that has, quite frankly, that's rocked all the industries around the world. But healthcare has been, you know, at the, the focal point of COVID. You had uh, in 2020, everybody pretty much ponied up, or what you call soldiered up and, and stood tall in all the medical professionals in the United States, you know, went in and did what they had to do. Everybody was kind of shoulder to shoulder doing the right thing. And then in 21, you had what we called in the industry COVID fatigue. And that was all these people that were working all these crazy hours and, you know, going through all these procedures and wearing all kinds of different gowns and all the other things they had to do were fried. They were done. They were burned out. And it, and it wasn't over. Even though there was a, there was a vaccine out there, the protocols were still, still in place. So you started to see people in the uh, medical profession leave because they, they couldn't handle the, the stress. They couldn't handle the, the hours. And then there was the VAX mandate later in the year. And there was, you know, you saw people, hospitals firing a thousand people because mm-hmm. they wouldn't take the VAX. Well, a lot of other people said, well, I'm going to get fired. I'm leaving now. So it, there was a lot of crazy stuff. Yeah. And we are kind of in, in 2022 and 23, our industry was digging out of what I just described. Okay. You basically had almost two straight years of crazy. Now the crazy is kind of subsided. And now we're just trying to plan on a stable forward path. And that's what I do. I'm, I'm a CEO. So mm-hmm. I spend time thinking, contemplating about the past, the internal, external threats, internal and external opportunities. And I, you know, I try to anticipate that, you know, failure to anticipate is probably the number one reason why battles are lost and wars are lost and eventually empires are lost. So you have to, like I said before, you have to clear your mind and you have to be open to new information. Technology is changing things rapidly. Mm-hmm. So all these little all these little things I mentioned, all these dynamics, are what a good CEO should be focusing on and planning for and preparing for, along with preparing his team. Yeah, you mentioned the advancement of technology. Do you see that changing the vision of legacy care in the, in the coming future? 
Well, internally, it's a great opportunity. So we have ways of streamlining difficult work, chunky, clunky kind of work. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're working on some of that right now. There's technology that is applied to outside vendors we rely on that streamlines and improves what they can do for us mm -hmm. for the same price. So that's helpful. And, and sometimes it's that, that the economy that they create or the efficiency they create ends up being an actual dollar amount to us. Like when they're processing, you know, the charges for patients being seen by medical person, medical personnel. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like washing gold out of a ton of dirt. You've got to go through this big, long thing. And at the end, you have some grains of gold, right? Right. And you can, and if the process is as optimized as possible, you can have a lot of gold or you can have a little bit of gold. So that process, every step in that process can be technology empowered and advantaged. And, and that's been happening. I mean, I mean, COVID you know, obviously accelerated things like cloud-based computing, cloud-based cloud uh, interaction, and accelerate a lot of other technology too. So I'm really happy with what I'm seeing on kind of business support for medical companies and, and, and healthcare companies. The business kind of ecosystem supporting us, that the industry is is advancing and getting smarter and using AI and things like that. So that seems to be something that's always a, a, a nice surprise. Mm -hmm. Hey, we want to talk to you guys. This is what we're doing now. Hey, we have this new analytics package that can do this stuff. Oh, wow, that's great. Uh -huh. Externally, you know, medicine right now, we're, we're not to the point of like the old Star Trek thing where you laid on a bed and the bed uh -huh. told you what the patient's problems were. You still have to have a person checking a pulse and... The uh, we aren't, we aren't surgeons. We don't do surgery. I had cancer in in 2017, and I went through the uh, was kidney cancer, and I went through the the Da Vinci robot thing. Hmm. So there was this big big ass robot, you know, <laughs> poking holes in me. And the doctor, yeah. the surgeon, was in the other room someplace, working toggles. You know, yeah. hopefully he was playing that game and not <laughs> some other game like right. Halo or whatever. <laughs> and my neighbor just went through the same exact process for the same for her kidney, and my mother in law went through it the year after me. So that technology is, is not as well known, mm -hmm. but it's, it's been around for like a decade, getting better and better and better and better. Right. I mean, that Da Vinci thing, you can actually, that's my, my uh, surgeon could have operated the, the same thing if that Da Vinci was in the middle of Africa. If that, were both, if that robot was in the middle of Africa and had good solid Wi-Fi, he could have done the entire operation from Virginia Beach where I'm sitting. Jeez. Yeah. So things like that, like 3D printing, those kinds of things, nobody's really conceived of yet but 3d printing is is printing you know body parts and you know all mm -hmm. kinds of, i think some heart they're looking at heart valves where you're actually using human cell tissue as the as the material and then it can get 3d printed as a you know as an ear or something like crazy stuff yeah, and it's coming and it's out there and like i said some of it i won't know it's it's going to positively affect me until i get an email or mm -hmm. you know a phone call hey guess what we've just done or hey how would you like to look at this I guess the one part of technology that's kind of a downside is if you if say we couldn't do something like this, let's say Zoom didn't exist mm -hmm. or, and all the other types of cloud-based um, video conferencing didn't is, exist, we would all have been forced after COVID to get back together again mm -hmm. and see each other face-to-face. -face. And there, there's a, a human kind of collaboration, a human, you know, you can't read somebody's tells in a room mm -hmm. if you're not in the room with them. Right. And you, know, you and I are sitting here on this podcast, so we know we're, we're being looked at. We'll, we'll, this will be looked at later and heard. Well, that's how people are acting in these teleconference meetings. Mm -hmm. They're sitting there staring at you with their game face. You can't see if they're they're bouncing their knee. You can't see if they're twiddling their thumbs. You can't. Yeah. See. And and everybody's faces are there, and so everybody's on, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's on stage. Everybody's got their game face, and everybody's pretty good at it now. Yeah, there was a lot of fun in the beginning where you know <laughs> somebody was somebody got up and was flushing a toilet and forgot right. to take the mic over. But now everybody's pretty much like looking at you. Yes. Well, think about a conference room. When you get into a conference room and somebody at one end starts talking about an idea, as a leader, I can look at the body language of everybody in the room. I can see somebody look at the person next to you and roll their eyes. I can see somebody get excited. I I can see it, feel it, and register it and remember it. And also, the, there's a, a different way of communicating one-on-one. -on -one. Human beings tend to be fairly flat, kind of toneless when they're going through texts and emails and, and even this, this venue. 
But when you're face to face, you start to get the emotions, you start to get the juices flowing, and you start to get passionate. And and passion is not the words, and passion isn't the volume. Passion is seeing the twinkle in somebody's eyes. Mm-hmm. Passion is seeing them the body language and seeing them like push forward with you mm-hmm. know emphasis. And these are all things as humans we register and it actually hits on a lot of different levels. We absorb that message on four or five different levels. Right. That's that's almost impossible to do because the technology has made it so easy to not do it. Mm-hmm. No, that's very interesting to think about. I'm for one and very thankful for this just because I'd be doing a lot of air miles and especially being in Nevada, having to go over to Virginia. <laughs> It'd be a little difficult to have that conversation. But no, you're absolutely right. I think that it does play a, a big factor in have these conversations i mean yeah we can somewhat read body language but really just for us to the top half you know so that's very interesting thank you for touching on that i do appreciate it so in addition to running legacy care you're also a board member for best robotics can you tell us a bit more about what they do at best robotics and its mission and then also share what your role entails as a member of the board sure so best robotics has been around for 31 years it was started by a couple of engineers with texas instruments we were based in Texas, and they thought it would be a good thing if kids in high school were able to engage with science and math and technology in a fun way mm. and kind of take the fear or the stigma out of you know the hard sciences and math, things like that. And they thought, well, the vehicle would that would probably work that would stimulate youth would be something like a robot. It's kind of fun to do. And this is a long time ago, right? Everybody's seen robot, you know, videos of robots fighting each other. I mean, this is this is not bad. It's not robot MMA. But it's been that's been around for a long time. So this is 31 years ago when they came up with this. Yeah. And what they do is they they create a challenge. And the challenge is different every single year. And the participants are in sixth through twelfth grade. So They're given the specifications of the challenge. They're given the physical layouts of what they call the field. And I'll just, I'll use an example. Let's say it's it's a half half court basketball, uh, half a basketball court with the hoop at the standard height, and they would get all that information. And the challenge is they have to make so many three-point shots from anywhere around the three-point line Mm -hmm. in 90 seconds. Okay. So... Their challenge would then be to how do I build a robot that is going to come out there and from that fixed point distance away from the hoop, launch a basketball as often as possible, as accurately as possible with proper arc and everything else in 90 90 seconds to get the highest possible score. So that's that's kind of the gist of it. Now, the... The field is not a basketball court, but it's usually other things. Like a year ago, it was uh, the theme was supply chain. So the field was was four different duplicate sections. So there's four teams that come up to the field and they they compete for ninety seconds, or whatever. And then when they're done, they're scored on how many how many of the um, tasks they were able to complete with the robot. Okay. So in that case, it was there was hooks and cranes and booms and things on the robots, and they had to move up and down and pick up little little blocks and move them into baskets and pick up other little blocks and move them into something else. And, and so basically it was all about supply chain, moving stuff like like an Amazon facility, storage facility, where they're trying mm-hmm. to move stuff and in inventory. This year, it was about the the uh, Da Vinci Robotics. Oh. <laughs> it was called in, Incision Decision. And it was about going into the field. And the field was a mock-up of a human body. Two half arms sticking out, two half legs, and the torso and head. And they had to go in. It's kind of like the old game uh, operation. They had to go in and they had to be able to insert things or pull things out and do different things that were related to surgery that a robotic sur- uh, surgical device would do. Jeez. And how many of those things they accomplished. And it's it's scaled. So the more difficult things are more points, but and, but you can get fewer points for simpler things to do in, in higher repetition. So you have to game it out. The other aspect of this is there's no adults telling them what to do. There's no adults allowed to, to coach them on how to build the things. Uh, they spend six to eight weeks building it. The teams are anywhere from 10 to 17, usually in university venues. And with all the parents and everything, you, you can't hear anything. It's like a, a nonstop basketball rally. Mm-hmm. They have to create a company around the robot. They have to create a marketing plan around the robot's company. They have to create a website for the company. They have to create a, a convention booth. I mean, a, this is a professional convention booth, just yeah. like 
IBM or anybody else would have. And on Friday, the teams, they have the business presentations, their, uh, their business sides evaluated, the marketing plans presented by the team. People are sitting there judging and, and scoring. Mm-hmm. And the next day, Saturday, is the competitive part of it. Last part. And it's up to 29 locations in the United States now. It's all over oh, the place. Wow. Okay. So what you end up with is um, you have the competition. And let's say they have to do, so there's 10, 10 rounds of the event. When they get there, they got what they built. And they have these tables. And they have Dremel tools and, and all the pieces and parts and wires and, and PVC pipe and foam and balsa wood and anything they need, little motors to repair the robot, but also to do one other thing. That's to rapidly prototype and improve the robot design. Hmm. So they get out there and when they get their turn, everybody's watching, they get through it. And besides the score, they're coming back with, what did we learn? Yeah. They kind of do a, a real-time gap analysis against the requirements of the field and how it really ended up forming in that field in real time and space. And then they're back there for the next you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes before it's their turn to come back out again. And they're, and they're refixing and redesigning and all stuff uh-huh. and then testing and and they're all, all doing it. And if you get a pretty good competition, you know, you've got maybe 15 to 20 teams around the arena mm-hmm. doing this massive, you know, hyper effort to uh, rapid prototype all their robots based on what they just learned while the competition is also going on with whoever's on deck. Yeah. And so it's really, it's really cool. And I was asked by the executive director to, um, help him initially with strategy mm-hmm. they were approaching the 30th anniversary and to help them figure out what their secret sauce was and i didn't know anything about robotics so i started just asking questions talking to all the engineers mostly on the board and then i went to the competition and you know i thought the competition itself would, you know the field would be the place to be after about an hour i spent the entire rest of the day by the by the rapid prototyping action and that was the coolest thing yeah. just watching their brains Fix this stuff because you got, you know, six to 12th graders. So there's a range there mm-hmm. and there's no alpha person. There's no like leader that tells everybody what to do. Everybody's collaborating, communicating. So I soaked all that up, wrote it up, said, this is what I think this is really all about. It's about creating an experience and it's transformational for these kids and maybe for their parents too, to see that their, their kids are capable of doing this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. A huge number of the kids in the program over the last 31 years have gone on to MIT and all these big, you know, programs and are in big technology companies. So after I completed my analysis and, and gave it to the director, they kind of wanted me to join the board. So then I joined the board. Mm. And so I'm still kind of working on the big picture strategy stuff and developed a, um, a company a spinoff called best mind lab, which is all about creativity innovation for adults and for oh. corporate leaders. So it's been fun. And my, my third book that, that just popped out yesterday for pre-sale called Be Different is almost entirely about what I learned from the experience with Best Robotics, about mm-hmm. creativity, innovation, how we all start off as kids with all this, all this imagination and this ability to, to you know think big thoughts and dream and try and experiment. And so what if we fail? And then schools and other institutions pound it out of us because you're supposed to Memorize the past that they're teaching you, regurgitate the past. Ideas are co- tossed aside dreams, you know. Hey, I mm-hmm. want to be a lead singer in a guitar band. Everybody tells you that's a stupid idea, right? And so you crush it out of them, and then they get into into their first job, and it's you're in cubicle seven. You can't go to the third, fourth, or fifth floor. Right. You have to park in the back part of the parking lot. You, you know, it's nothing but rules and containment, and it's culture, but the onboarding is really like the Marine Corps. It's what you can, can't do, where you can, mm-hmm. can't go. And then you get into meetings and now you know what you can and can't say, what 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 topics and, and areas of the company you're you're, you're not supposed to say crap in because that's not your that's not your job description. You do that for five, six, seven, eight years. You're basically an adult that forgot that you even knew how to think creatively. Mm-hmm. Creatively. So that's what Best Mind Lab is trying to address. Oh, that is incredible. You know, I I think that's great because you're absolutely right. You're away from it for so long. Even I I think of it more as like the When you're in elementary school compared to even high school, you know, you're in the creative aspect of your life when you're in elementary school, coloring, designing, then high school, it's more just subject based. That's a really good point. I did have a question about that, uh, the events. So you said 29 different locations? Yeah. 29. Is it all going on at the same time? No, they're they're all scheduled slightly differently. 
Yeah, and there's regionals and things like that. But gotcha. uh, yeah, I remember the first one I went to, I was told, make sure you bring some earplugs or something, you know, <laughs> and I said, earplugs? Yeah. <laughs> I got I got there and they asked me if I could say a few words because they thought they'd be excited that a, the, a seal that was on the board was there. Yeah. And it was like a, uh, it was like some kind of weird gladiator movie or something. You know, they all, they all quieted down. I went out there and then they introduced me and said, you know, I was a Navy SEAL and the place went, ah. oh, that's <laughs> like, awesome. like I was Michael Jordan, you know, yeah. at, at the NBA playoffs. And yeah. I went, wow, I mean, so much energy, you know, they're so positive. How cool is and, that? Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's a great organization. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure that felt great and much deserved, you know. So that yeah. is Yeah, and they don't charge they don't charge the kids. Really? It's all it's all money that's raised. There's other robotics competitions that charge the participants anywhere from two to three thousand bucks mm. to compete. They don't do that here. Wow. What an amazing concept. I'll definitely have to start looking more into it. So that is that is great. You mentioned your your newest book. I did want to talk a little bit about your previous books and what sure. inspired you to write those books. So be nimble and be visionary. And what lessons do you hope readers will take away from those? Well, I think I mentioned a little bit about the point of be nimble. Yes. And yes. that was to try to assemble my thoughts and get them on paper. I mean, most, of, most of being nimble is about crisis leadership. Mm. A lot of it has to do with scaling. Because that from my consulting and talking to uh, other CEOs and small company owners, they don't they they start out and they get to a certain size. And then if success hits them and they have to grow bigger, they don't know how to do it. And so it becomes a crisis, even though it's a positive thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the old, uh, you know, I, I've got, I bought a hundred hula hoops and they, and they were sold in 10 minutes. And then I ordered 200 hula hoops and they were sold in five minutes. And I ordered 500 hula hoops and they were sold in a minute. And now I've got 400 people outside my door screaming for over a thousand more hula hoops. And I yeah. can't, I don't have any more hula hoops. So you, a lot of times you don't prepare for success that way. Mm -hmm. And, it, and then somebody at the top says, do it anyway. And all that load falls on all these different layers of management and leadership. And if they've never done it before, they don't even know how to start. So there's a lot of that in being nimble, how to basically step back, think it through everything from reorganize, reorganizing and designing the organization itself from a functionality standpoint for the new normal, how to uh, train, coach, and mentor the talent, how to select the talent, because selecting talent for a rapidly scaling company is a little bit different than a static company that's kind of, you know, easy, easy going and everything. Mm -hmm. You can find people that are comfortable with that. And there's just as many people that will go nuts if they're sitting there and there's nothing you know interesting to do and they'll leave. Right. But if you take some of those stages you go people and you put them in that rapidly scaling environment, they're going to leave because mm -hmm. they don't like crazy. They don't like, you know, everybody's jobs changing or here's five more collateral tasks, you know, because <laughs> right. you're only going to have them very long. And then in a month or so, we'll hire somebody, you know. Yeah, so that's, that's what being nimble is about. Be visionary. The subtitle is Strategic Leadership in the Age of Optimization. That's kind of my thesis on the death of strategy and the death of vision. And I describe basically how to do it. I, just, I say everybody's capable of it. They've just been told not to do it. They've been told to optimize by looking in the rearview mirror. Mm -hmm. And kind of like we were talking about yeah. the technology enabling us it. There's a lot of technology that's enabled us to see in micro measurement format what happened yesterday, last month, six months ago. And none of it's telling us what's about to happen to us. Hmm. It's not helping us anticipate it. The unfortunate thing is people say, well, if this is so good looking backwards, it's probably just as good looking forward. So let's take what happened in the last three months and flop it forward and add 2%. Mm -hmm. And that's our, that's our strategy. That's our game plan. That's my right. goal setting methodology. If the world's taking a hard right and you've got, you know, the last couple of months or years, whatever, and you've decided to project forward the way it's always been, you're going to miss the turn. Mm -hmm. And that happens to people all the time and, and more and more because people are spending so much time focusing on what they can count and measure about what happened. So, you know, it talks a lot about it's the leader's responsibility to think big, but that could be the leader of a division or a department it doesn't have to be the leader of a big conglomerate. And uh, and then the third book, Be Different, is I mentioned, is about creativity and innovation. It kind of starts the same way as Be Visionary. It's kind of, hey, it's okay to have a dream. It's okay to think this way. It's the way the brain is designed. Mm -hmm. Best Mind Lab works with all these different guys from all over the world that are, that are experts in the psychology, the biology of the brain, 
related to innovation, creativity, the brain, unless you have Alzheimer's or dementia, the brain at 60 functions the same way as a six-year-old when it comes to creativity. You've been conditioned to not use your brain that way. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that's an impossibility. It's not a biological block to you becoming creative, truly creative, mm -hmm. not once in a while creative, but I mean, really creative where you let it all hang out and you, you just come up with crazy wild ideas and throw them around and everybody bounce, bounce them off each other. It's not an age related thing. It's, it's a conditioning compliance to structure related thing. It's holding people back. So that's what the third book's about. Oh, that's incredible. Would you advise that they read it from first, be nimble, be visionary, and then for any of the listeners who are going to look to pick up these books? I think be nimble and be visionary can be read one, two. It would make sense. Okay. And because one's about practical leadership, the other one's about, you know, bigger thinking leadership. Be different. You could read at any time. It's not connected to either of the others. Mm -hmm. It's more about how to think. I mean, the subtitle is, you know, how Navy SEALs and entrepreneurs bend, break, or ignore the rules to get results. So it's really about operating mechanically as a person and how your brain is uh, is capable of doing all these other things in a different way. And and it doesn't matter if it's related to your family or related to your business or just in general. It's it's kind of making you aware that, that you can do a heck of a lot more with that, what they say in the military, your brain housing group. Right. <laughs> Definitely. So I thought I saw that uh, Be Different was projected to come out August 2024. You just mentioned pre-sale now. So is that still there? Is it looking to maybe? Uh, it's, you know, now on, on Amazon, I actually got to check with my publisher because it was supposed to come out at the end of the summer. Oh, okay. And they on, the, on the Amazon pre-sale, it says December. Mm. So I'm going to try to confirm that. They like to keep it out there for five or six months for pre-sale. Okay. They did that with the other books too. And so it builds up momentum and they're doing mm -hmm. all kinds of marketing and they want me to do marketing and promotion and all that, you know, and usually so far when one book comes out, the book before it also has a big jump in sales because people want to kind of see the other, the other version of it. Right. And they've been well, really well received. So I'm pretty happy. I use beta readers. So that's a, like a test reader. Mm -hmm. So I have several CEOs, different industries and different ages, and I have them read chapter by chapter in my business books. Nice. And give me feedback. I got to tell them what I'm intending to do, kind of where I'm aiming, and then go for it. Mm. And we're all kind of, we trust each other and they can say this really stinks or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm fine with it. I do the entire book one, one, one right through to draft one before I go back and start looking at those chapters and, and start taking in their input. Oh, okay. So I don't lose the flow of my thought process. Mm -hmm. And that tightens the books up and that makes like they catch things. They, you know, they'll say, hey, this was perfect. That was a great case study. This was a perfect metaphor or example or comparison, or this just doesn't, this doesn't work at all. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, and, you know, 99 times out of 100, they're right. So right. I've already been kind of pre-vetted by kind of the end user of what I'm writing about mm -hmm. before I even send it to the publisher. Right. Yeah. By book three, you're probably ready to go by this point, but I'm sure they, they give you suggestions as well. You, if they think it might not be a good idea, do they also give you suggestions or is it more so just this isn't as good as it should be? Maybe three. No, no, it. no. They give me, they give me very specific. I mean, in, uh, I think it was be visionary. So the books are written like I'm a, um, I'm consulting with you, like I'm mentoring you. Okay. They're conversational in style and I mix business and seal examples when and where they make sense in every chapter. And it's, I didn't want it to sound or feel like a textbook. I wanted it to be kind of the book I like to read because I've, I've done, I read 61 books last year. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a nut about reading. Nice. And so if I start getting into a book where it's like, womp, 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 and mm -hmm. then I, I start losing interest. So I think, yeah, it was probably the second or third, or fourth chapter, be visionary, all three of them. But one of them was pretty, um, pretty concise in his criticism. He said, for whatever reason, you shifted into techno mode and wrote, a technical, a technical narrative in chapter three that sounds like it's right out of an, you know, an instruction guidebook. <laughs> Not only that, there was only one example in the whole chapter, and usually you sprinkle in a, a, a number of them that you're tying these these thoughts to. Mm -hmm. And I had to rewrite the whole thing from scratch. I mean, wow. I looked at it and he was dead right. Somehow I shifted into like business writing. Yes. You know, <laughs> like I'm writing a proposal or something, you know, very stilted. And yeah, I mean, I, I published nine novels mm. and I get the same kind of thing. I've got a different group of people. Right. And, uh, but what's really helpful is when, 
remember, I, I, I write the whole thing first, then I go back and look at all the chapter by chapter commentary. And it might be four different people that I'm using on novels. And if they if time travel novel series, they had to be people that like those books and sealed novels yeah. they had to like those books. But I had, you know, hey, uh, you know, you know, the hero Matt in chapter seven was left handed and in chapter three he was right handed. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because you, yeah, you, you start you get better as time goes on because you mm-hmm. you realize Rob Patterson's got a great master class out on this stuff and in mysteries and the kinds of things he writes. He said everything you say is going to happen or everything you imply is going to happen. You owe that debt to the reader because they're going to register in their mind and they think it's coming. And yeah. so what he does is he has somebody, an assistant that goes through and reads and kind of highlights every single solitary thing that looks like a promise of something to come. Some kind of, you can't foreshadow and then never mention it again, yeah. right? He doesn't, And you also can't leave any loose strings because the readers will um, resent you for it. Right. You've got to close it off. And, but if you get, you go in a store and you think, oh, well, that's not going to work and you leave it there, mm-hmm. they're going to finish the book going, whatever happened, Phil, who went and got on that train that day. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, they keep you honest and that's different kinds of writing, but it's the same thing. You get feedback and you have people tell you you're, you're, you're spot on or you're way off. Right. Yeah. I've even had that happen in a couple of the business books that I've read you know, where they start with something and then they never really follow back up on it. And you're like, wait a minute, what happened? Well, I can't wait to get my hands on those books. I'm excited and I'll, I'll make sure those are in the show notes and uh, whenever, you know, for the pre-sale and then, you know, as uh, it gets closer to that release date, I'll make sure that I'm promoting it as well. Thank you. Yeah, of course. So how can listeners engage with you, learn more about Legacy Care and as well as get their hands on the book? Is it mostly Amazon? Yeah. Um, my So they can go to my website. It's martystrongbenimble.com. And there's information about my speaking programs and articles and things like that. A lot of uh, reviews, but at the bottom, there's a cover of my business books. And then there's covers of the two series I did in um, my two, no- two novel series. And if you click any of those books, they'll take you straight to the point of purchase at Amazon. Perfect. All right. Sounds good. And then people can follow you on LinkedIn as well. Yep. Yeah. I'm on LinkedIn. I post, post an article Sunday. I post articles on the themes we've discussed in this podcast, actually, uh, they're about 27 or eight. Mm. Some of them were published like through Fast Company or CEO World or CNBC Online or whatever, but uh, not all of them. Some of them I just, Sunday had a stream of consciousness thing and I yeah. just thought about it. So I just wrote it out and popped it out there. Perfect. All right. Well, that's great. Hopefully a lot of the listeners connect with that and they can go and follow all of your content. So I do appreciate our time together, Marty. I do have one more question before I let you go. If yeah. you could if you could offer one piece of advice to future leaders that encapsulates your leadership philosophy, what would it be and why is it important for aspiring leaders to embrace it? I'd be the first I have three principles of of creativity which kind of fall into the same same category as, as good leadership. The first principle is intellectual humility. So the direct answer to your question is you need to stay humble and be humble so that the second the second step in my three steps is to then become intellectually curious. Intellectual curiosity means that once you're humble, you're willing to accept input from other sources. You're not constantly saying, I know, I know it all. I've, I've done it all. I've got the formula for this. And that means a 360 degree kind of soaking up of everything you can get from outside your normal sources, from outside just the people that work with you or whatever, even other industries, different age groups. And then uh, the third step is intellectual creativity. Which, you know, I think leadership exercised every day has a lot to do with creativity. Right. Creativity and judgment slash wisdom are probably the two halves of it. 